Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar from Wisonic Dead Lion Project. Uh, this is Mandy from Wisonic, which is the uh, innovative professional manufacturer of ultrasound with the clinically focused solution. And today, together with Wisonic, we are very pleasant to invite the, the Nepal's Association for the Study of Pain to be the academic partner today. And also, very thanks to our channel partner, uh, NS Biomedical, to offer the machine for demonstration. So, Mr. Neganja, as the representative of NS Biomedical, would you like to say something here? Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Namaste. I'm Nagendra Srista on the behalf of NS Biomedical, Kathmandu, Nepal. We are honored to co sponsor today's webinar with the Wisonic Medical. Many, many of you have a huge effort to join us today. We are extremely grateful to all the participants and accept our call to has been being here with us. And we, uh, in this business webinar, we like to talk about the sono anatomy and ultrasound technology in diagnosis of pain. Uh, our, our this is good moderator, Dr. Siris Prasad Amate and speaker, Dr. Niyadini Srestha. I would like to thanks to you also to the huge effort and also our uh, and also thanks to Nepal Association of the Study of the Pain and co-sponsor with Sonic, uh, with Sonic Medical and make it possible today's event. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Then uh, today's webinar, it will take about one hour and a half. The whole webinar will be performed by the moderator, Dr. Shrish, and the uh, speaker, Dr. Nina Dini. So uh, here I will have a, a brief introduction about the moderator, Dr. Shrish. He's the assistant professor from the Penton Academy of Health Sciences and also consultant pain physician from Nepal Pain Care and Research Center, and also the visiting faculty in Thayradiya, the pain clinic. He has very extensive experiences, no matter in academy or the practices in pain management. So Dr. Shrish, uh, please have an introduction about the speaker, Dr. Nina Dini, and also deliver the uh, opening speech. Uh, thank you, Mandy, for a, for a wonderful introduction. Um, uh, today, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, call, we saw it, uh, me and Nina Didi, as well as the whole uh, the, uh, Inter Association of Pain of Nepal, would like to conduct a seminar, which is a very important topic, uh, and it is based upon the um, ultrasound, um, the intervention, the sonoanatomy, uh, for the introduction of and the diagnosis of uh, pain. And as we all know, shoulder pain is one of the most common problem uh, uh, in the patient that is that are visiting the pain clinic. And uh, we all know that uh, though the history taking and clinical examination is uh, the uh, most important part in the diagnosis for any pain and management, uh, with the development of uh, who, uh, the medical science, especially the uh, the technology with us. Um, nowadays, a pain, in pain clinic, most of the pain physicians are uh, using the ultrasound for better diagnosis and treatment. And today we'll be trying to uh, share a light, a small light in this a vast topic um, uh, regarding the ultrasound image and the intervention. And uh, we are very lucky to be having Dr. Nina Dinesh Preshta, who is an inspiration in uh, Nepal in, in the field of pain management. Uh, she um, inspired me as well as uh, many pain physicians in uh, Nepal uh, to pursue the career of pain. Uh, she is a very uh, well, uh, um, she is an associate professor in the Department of uh, Anesthesiology in TUTH, as well as she is also a general secretary in the Nepal Association for Study of Pain. And she is very much uh, academically and clinically oriented person. And we are lucky to have uh, Nina Dini with us to be delivering the, uh, today's lecture. Okay, uh, pass on to Nina Dini for the uh, starting of the today's webinar. Thank you.
So Dr. Nidandini, please uh, share your screen. Okay, namaste and good morning, everybody. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, host this webinar as a speaker today. Uh, before starting, I'd like to express my sincere uh, gratitude to Vaisonic, uh, Ms. Mandy Chang, uh, Mr. Nagendra Shrestha, Inspire Medical for their encouragement and technical support. I'd also like to express my gratitude to our moderator, Dr. Suresh Prasad Amatil, for his kind words and uh, thank you for your time from his very busy schedule. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Anil Shrestha, who is the head of the department and president of Nepal Association for the Study of Pain. It was his initiative to, uh, uh, he approached me for this uh, webinar as a speaker. So without much delay, uh, we'll delve into the topic. So today's topic is sonoanatomy and ultrasound guided interventions in shoulder pain with live demonstration. Today, we'll be discussing some normal ultrasound appearance of the shoulder joint and its structures with a live demonstration first, following which we'll have a discussion on some common ultrasound guided shoulder interventions. Uh, to make the session a little bit oriented to clinical practice, we'll have a case scenario discussion, following which we'll have question and answer session. So starting with the basics of shoulder ultrasound, uh, many countries and many associations have different preference for position of the patient for shoulder ultrasound. But the guidelines uh, of many uh, societies and many countries still strongly recommend examining the position, examining the patient for shoulder ultrasound in the sitting position. Uh, the reason being that uh, if the patient is seated on a revolving tool, we can easily access the anterior, the lateral, as well as the posterior aspect of the shoulder. In the same time, we can compare it to the contralateral side. The probe that we use is a superficial high frequency linear array probe, like you can see in the slide. And the exam setting uh, can uh, preferentially can be a musculoskeletal setting or can be another setting, whichever suits you, which has a better musculoskeletal view. Uh, sometimes we, I often use thyroid uh, setting also for the MSK setting or for the musculoskeletal ultrasound of the shoulder joint. Regarding sonography of the shoulder joint, as Dr. Swedish rightly mentioned, it is a very complex structure and it is a very common problem. The second only to low back pain it is a complex structure with a lot of uh, the ligaments, the bursa, the bone, the labrum, and the nerve. And the sonography of shoulder joint is important not only for static evaluation, but also for dynamic evaluation. So today I have uh, divided uh, uh, the sonography of the shoulder joint into three aspects. Uh, the anterior aspect, I'll be uh, demonstrating the long head of the biceps tendon the subscapularis muscle and tendon, the acromioclavicular joint. In the lateral aspect, we will be uh, demonstrating the supraspinatus tendon, intraspinatus tendon, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and the rotator cuff interval. In the posterior aspect, we will be demonstrating the supraspinatus muscle belly, the infraspinatus muscle belly, and teres minor muscle and tendon, the posterior joint recess, and the suprascapular nerve. So now we'll start uh, with the live demonstration. So now we're going to demonstrate the ultrasound scanning of the shoulder joint. From anterior aspect of the shoulder joint, we will be evaluating first the wrong head of biceps tendon, the soft scapularis muscle and tendon, and the acromioclavicular joint. We identify the long head of biceps tendon on the transverse view by placing the ultrasound, ultrasound probe along the anterior stack of the humerus. And as we scan upwards, we see the bicipital groove, which is formed medially by the lesser tuberosity and formed laterally by the greater tuberosity. The long head of biceps tendon is seen as an echogenic oval structure, which is very prone to an isotrope. So as I rock my probe anteriorly and posteriorly, the appearance of the long head of biceps tendon changes. So once I scan the long head of biceps, I go all the way above 
from the rotator cuff interval superiorly and then I scan all the way down till there is appearance of the pectoralis major tendon. So that's where I stop scanning the long head of biceps tendon. So as the, uh, so on the short axis, uh, of scanning of the long head of biceps tendon, what I see is that the long uh, the long head of biceps tendon is in the bicipital groove. It is neither dislocated nor is it subluxated. Also, what we would look uh, what we would like to look for is possibility of a hypoechoic halo around the uh, tendon. So, if the there is a hypoechoic halo around the tendon, then we know that there is a effusion uh, within the biceps tendon sheath. So, but there is no halo, so there is no effusion. So, once we see the biceps tendon in the short axis, what I do is carefully turn my probe 90 degrees to see the biceps tendon in the long axis. So, once I see the biceps tendon in the long axis, I scan it all the way up. I trace it all the way up. And then I trace it all the way down till it's myotendinous junction. That's myotendinous junction of the bicep tendon. Again, scanning it all the way up. Okay, so after looking at the long head of biceps tendon, now we can have a look at the subscapularis muscle and tendon. After looking at the long head of biceps tendon, now we'll be scanning the subscapularis muscle and tendon. We can we start scanning from the same place where we have looked at the bicipital group. Now I would like to ask my volunteer to externally rotate his arm as much as possible. So what this maneuver does, it brings out the subscapularis muscle and tendon from below the coracoid process. So immediately when I scan, I have to look for my bony landmark. So this is the coracoid process. And I scan laterally, and I see that the whole of the subscapularis muscle, which is changing, this is the myotendinous junction, and then it goes over and then gets inserted to the lesser tuberosity. So while I scan the subscapularis tendon, I have to scan it whole superiorly to see the whole extension of the tendon, inferiorly as well as anteriorly and posteriorly. So this was the long axis of the subscapularis muscle and tendon. So after looking at the subscapularis muscle and tendon, now I turn my probe 90 degree to look at the short axis view of the subscapularis muscle. So we can, this is the short axis view of the subscapularis muscle and tendon. Here we can see that it has a multiplanar appearance with a lot of hypoechoic and hyperechoic bands in between. So we should not be confusing this with any tendinosis or interstitial tear. So this is how a subscapularis muscle appears in a short axis. So again, I have to see the whole uh, section of the uh, muscle and tendon. So I scan it medially, laterally, superiorly, and inferiorly to see how, if there is any uh, pathology in the subscapularis muscle or tendon. So now we're going to look at the acromioclavicular joint. It is a very superficial structure and we can see it by either palpating the very superficial AC joint and putting our probe over it, or we can just scan the bicipital groove again. And from the bicipital groove, we just scan up, 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 and we reach the acromioclavicular joint. Here, the acromioclavicular joint is formed medially by the clavicle and laterally by the acromion process. So another method is we can always palpate the clavicle and the most prominent bony structure is the acromion process and we just drop our probe over it and we can see the acromioclavicular joint. Again, 
medially it's the uh, cortex the hyperechoic cortex of the clavicle which is uh, causing an acoustic shadow and laterally it is the acrimen process we can scan the whole of the ac joint superiorly and anteriorly and posteriorly and superiorly it is formed there's a superior acromial clavicular ligament which we can see and the hyperechoic structure deep inside the joint is the fibrocartilage structure inside the joint so we have to look for any osteophytes or any uh, irregularity in the joint space or if we can also look at by dynamic scanning the laxity in the joint or at the dislocation of the joint So now we're going to look at the lateral aspect of the shoulder joint. Here we are going to scan the supraspinatus muscle and tendon, the infraspinatus muscle and tendon, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and the rotator cuff interval. So first we'll have a look at the supraspinatus muscle and tendon. I place my probe in the long axis, long axis view of the supraspinatus muscle. So what this maneuver does is it brings out the supraspinatus muscle from under the uh, I just like to highlight that uh, the position of the patient for evaluation of the supraspinatus muscle, it, uh, it is a modified crash uh, position in which the patient reaches his hand for the back pocket and uh, the uh, elbow is flexed and the shoulder is extended. Chromium complex. So it appears as a bird's beak appearance. Almost all rotator cuff muscles have a bird beak appearance. This is on the long axis. I scan the whole of the length of the supraspinatus muscle. So to identify the muscle, I think it's always uh, best for beginners to count our layers. So let's count our layers in the scan. The most hyperechoic structure superficially is the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, below which we see a dark a hypoechoic uh, deltoid muscle, which has fibrillar bands below which we see a hyperechoic line again, which is a subacromial subdeltoid bursa, below which it is a, there is a hyperechoic supraspinatus muscle, and below which there is a hyperechoic cortex of the head of the humerus, below which there is an acoustic shadow. So to know whether we are completely aligned our probe with the long fibers of the supraspinatus muscle, uh, we can look at the fibers of the deltoid muscle, and we, if the myofibrillar complex is parallel, then we know that we are on the long axis. Another way by which we can know whether we are in the complete long axis or not alignment is by looking at the long axis of the long head of biceps tendon. Now we are going to have a look at the lateral aspect of the shoulder joint. Here we are going to look at the supraspinatus muscle and tendon, the infraspinatus tendon, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and the rotator cuff interval. So first we'll ask our volunteer to uh, flex his elbow, extend his shoulder, and put his hands in his back pocket. So what this maneuver does is, is it brings out the supraspinatus muscle and tendon from below the acromial edge. After positioning the patient, we'll put our probe along the long fibers of the supraspinatus muscle. So the supraspinatus muscle uh, along the long fibers, it looks, it has this bird's beak appearance, like almost all the rotator cuff muscles on long axis has this bird's beak appearance. So as a beginner, it, to identify the muscle, it's always a good idea to count your layers in the screen. So let's count our layers. On top, most the most uh, the hyperechoic line is the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. After that, there is this hypoechoic muscle layer, which is the deltoid muscle. Inside the deltoid muscle, we can see parallel muscle fibers. Just below the deltoid muscle, there is a, a white line, a hyperechoic line, which is the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Uh, it is actually a potential space which is now completely collapsed. Which, in case of effusion, we can see a collection over there. It's hyperechoic because of its fat content. Just below this subacromial subdeltoid bursa, we can see the supraspinatus muscle, the long fibers. We can see the fibrillar pattern of the muscle fibers. Below the supraspinatus muscle, is there is a hypoechoic uh, 
cartilage, which is the articular cartilage, and below the articular cartilage, the hyaline cartilage, there is this white line again, which is the head of the humerus cortex. So after counting our layers, uh, how do we know that we are actually, my probe is aligned along the long fibers of the supraspinatus? So we can look at the deltoid muscle and look at this uh, parallel muscle fiber uh, echogenic lines. If those lines are parallel to each other and to the supraspinatus muscle, we know that we are parallel to the long fibers of the supraspinatus muscle. Another way of doing this is we can also look at the biceps tendon long fibers, as you can see over here inside the supraspinatus muscle. So if we see the long fibers in the long axis of the biceps tendon, that also tells us that our probe is aligned parallelly with the long fibers of the supraspinatus muscles. After counting our uh, layers, we have to scan the supraspinatus muscle and tendon in the whole of it. So we scan it superiorly to inferiorly, anteriorly to posteriorly, all the way. And as we scan the supraspinatus muscle posteriorly, so here we can see that the supra, the, we can see the infraspinatus tendon coming into the picture. With, and both of them, the supraspinatus as well as the infraspinatus, it goes on and inserts to the greater tuberosity. So scanning uh, supraspinatus posteriorly uh, might be a little confusing to uh, identify the infraspinatus tendon. Uh, so there's an easy way to doing it. We look at our uh, greater trochanter. So the greater trochanter is more, uh, it has this uh, configuration of this little... Um, I'm sorry, I meant the greater tuberosity. Sharp edge anteriorly, while where we scan posteriorly, it becomes rounded, as you can see in the scan. So when we are anteriorly and if the greater trochanter is pointed like that, we know that we are looking at the supraspinatus uh, tendon. As we scan posteriorly, when the greater trochanter becomes rounded, we know that we're looking at the infraspinatus uh, tendon fibers. You can scan it all the way posteriorly to see its insertion and see whether the tendons are uh, normal or pathological. So one more thing to note is that when we are scanning the supraspinatus muscles along its long axis and we go all the way up to see its insertion to the greater tuberosity, sometimes we may uh, come across some anisotropy like this. So if we see an anisotropy like this, we should not jump into conclusion of a pathology. We should always rock our probe to trace whether we can see a normal fibrillar pattern of the supraspinatus uh, tendon. As long as we see this normal fibrillar pattern, uh, this is a normal tendon. This anisotropy could be because of the curving of the fibers of the supraspinatus tendon. So still, when we look at the insertion of the tendon to the greater tuberosity, we still see some uh, thin hypoechoic line that is the articular cartilage over which the fibers of the supraspinatus tendon go and uh, insert to the greater tuberosity. So after scanning the supraspinatus muscle along the long axis, I turn my probe 90 degree gradually. and evaluate the rotator cuff interval. Uh, so this rotator cuff interval, posteriorly, all these uh, fibers that we see is the supraspinatus tendon in the short axis. As I scan more posteriorly, we can see the infraspinatus tendon coming into the picture. Okay, again, anteriorly this rotator cuff interval, and as I scan posteriorly, we see the supraspinatus muscle fiber and tendon. And as I go more posteriorly, the infraspinatus tendon coming into the picture. So again, in a short axis, it's easier to differentiate whether we are looking at the supraspinatus muscle fibers or we are looking at the infraspinatus muscle fibers. So how do we do that? So we look at the greater tuberosity again. So greater tuberosity, uh, greater tuberosity has facets upon configuration. Anteriorly, the facets are more flattened. This is where the supraspinatus uh, tendon attaches. Posteriorly, it has a more oblique orientation, and that is where the infraspinatus tendon attached. And even more posteriorly, it has a very vertical uh, facet. That is where the teres minor tendon comes and attaches. Okay, so this is where the This is where the teres minor tendon comes and attaches. Okay. So now as we go anteriorly, just anterior to the supraspinatus uh, tendon is a rotator cuff interval. So 
So this is the rotator cuff interval. The rotator cuff interval is actually a space uh, uh, superiorly of which is the, as we just saw, supraspinal just muscle fibers and tendons. Inferiorly is the cephalic fibers of the subscapularized muscle. So as we go more anteriorly, from the posterior, we're looking at the supraspinatus fibers, and as we go anteriorly, now we'll be able to see the rotator cuff interval. Superiorly to the rotator cuff interval are the uh, supraspinatus tendon. When I go even more posteriorly, that's the infraspinatus tendon. And as we go anteriorly, that's the rotator cuff interval, the biceps tendon. Anterior to the biceps tendon are the cephalic fibers of the subscapularis muscle. So this is the rotator cuff interval. Rotator cuff interval is a space where superiorly it is bounded by the supraspinatus tendon, inferiorly by the cephalic fibers of the subscapularis muscle, and the floor is made by the head of the humerus. So looking at the rotator cuff is important. It consists of three structures. The hyperechoic uh, sort axis, a long head of biceps tendon. Uh, superior to the tendon is the coracohumeral ligament. Inferior to the tendon is the superior glenohumeral ligament. It is one of the dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder joint, and it is very commonly involved during the uh, pathology of uh, adhesive capsulitis. So this uh, ligament around the biceps, it forms an inverted C-shaped structure to hold the biceps tendon in place, which is also known as the biceps pulley. Now we are going to look at the posterior aspect of the shoulder joint. Here we are going to look at the supraspinatus muscle belly, the infraspinatus muscle belly, the teres minor muscle belly and tendon, the posterior joint recess, and the suprascapular nerve at the suprasternal notch and the spine of the glenoid notch. The bony landmarks that we need to remember is the spine of scapula. In thin individuals, we can easily palpate it. So this spine of scapula divides the shoulder, uh, the rotator cuff muscle belly into the supraspinatus fossa and the infraspinatus fossa. The supraspinatus muscle arises from the supraspinatus fossa and the infraspinatus muscle arises from the infraspinatus fossa. Now beginning to scan, we can just scan we can just scan um, along the spine of scapula, and we see that inferior to the spine of scapula, we can see the infraspinatus fossa and the infraspinatus muscle. So spine of scapula, above the spine of scapula, we can see the supraspinatus muscle fibers and tendons. So while we scan the supraspinatus muscle fibers and tendons, as we scan laterally, the lateral part of the supraspinatus muscle may be difficult to see because of the acromion complex saddle. Even along the long axis, when we are scanning the supraspinatus muscle fibers and tendon, we can see that this is uh, along the long axis, we can see the nice uh, myofibril patterns of the uh, supraspinatus muscle. And as we go laterally, we can see there is a myotendinous junction. And as this is the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle, but we cannot see beyond the acromion complex. Now, uh, we can, once I evaluate the supraspinatus belly, uh, anteriorly, posteriorly, uh, medially, and laterally, now we again go to the spine. Now, going inferiorly to the spine, the infraspinatal muscle belly on the short axis, we scan it like this, just below the spine of scapula, medial to lateral. Okay. So after identifying the infraspinatus muscle belly in the short axis, as we go laterally, we can see the teres minor coming into the picture. So below infraspinatus, there is a teres minor muscle. So after uh, identifying the infraspinatus muscle on the short axis, we turn the probe 90 degree to identify the long uh, axis view of the infraspinatus muscle. As we can see again, the nice uh, myofibrillar patterns and we scan all the way laterally till we see it turning into the tendon. This is the myofibrillar junction of the infraspinatus muscle. This is the tendon and it goes and inserts to the greater tuberosity. So below the infraspinatus is the teres minor muscle, which starts on the lateral part of the scapula. See my proposition as I scan laterally, 
on the lateral part of the scapula, we can see the teres minor muscle, which again forms the tendon below the infraspinatus muscle, goes all the way and then inserts to the greater tuberosity. It's easier to view the teres minor muscle in the short axis. So again, scanning the infraspinatus muscle in the short axis, as I go laterally, So we can see the teres minor muscle arising from the infraspinatus fossa, changing into the tendon below the uh, infraspinatus, and then going in, inserting to the bitter tuberosity. So now we shall try to trace the suprascapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve starts from the brachial plexus. It courses along the posterior triangle, and it did, it enters the shoulder, uh, the sole, shoulder girdle by the suprascapular notch. It gives a branch of the supraspinatus muscle. Then it winds around the spinal glenoid notch and gives a branch to the infraspinatus muscle to supply the motor supply. So now one way to identify the suprascapular nerve along the spinal scapula is we put our probe along the spinal scapula and we just uh, 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 slide our probe or walk our probe anteriorly. So see, this is the spine of scapula. And as we slide our probe anteriorly, we see that there is a defect in the uh, superior cortex of the scapula. So this is the suprascapular notch. In this notch, if we look carefully, we see a pulsating structure. So if you observe carefully, you can see it even in this gray scale. So that pulsating structure is the suprascapular artery. The nerve is just next to the suprascapular artery. Okay, so nerve is just next to the suprascapular artery. And you may or may not be able to see this signal on color Doppler. It doesn't matter because even in a gray scale, you can see the pulsation of the artery. Now, as the suprascapular suprascapular nerve leaves the branch of the suprascapular after crossing through the suprascapular notch. Now we have to look for the spinoglenoid notch. So it's easy to identify the spinoglenoid notch. We again look for the posterior glenohumeral joint. So when we find the posterior glenohumeral joint, we just scan little bit medially, okay? So we identify the joint and when we gently slide the probe medially, right medial, right medial to the posterior glenohumeral joint, is a valley-like structure, as you can see in the picture, right? So this is the spinoglenoid notch. So the sp uh, suprascapular nerve, it nestles in this notch. Again, you have to look for the pulsating suprascapular artery. So even in a gray scale, you are able to see that pulsating artery. So the suprascapular nerve will lie just next to the suprascapular artery. Again, in a color Doppler or a power Doppler, you may or you may not be able to visualize the artery. And it's that's all right. So sometimes what happens is small cyst uh, may appear in the uh, labrum, in the posterior superior labrum, uh, maybe because of trauma or uh, degeneration. A paralabral cyst may form, which can course medially, and then comes to the spinal glenoid notch, and then it may compress the suprascapular nerve which may cause atrophy of this infraspinatus muscle. So this may be one of the important uh, finding to see in a patient who is clinically who has weakness or atrophy of the infraspinatus muscle. Or Doppler, you may or you may not be able to visualize the artery. And it's, that's all right. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted so, to uh, emphasize on how to scan the posterior glenohumeral joint. So uh, how we scan the posterior glenohumeral joint is we just put our probe over the inf uh, posterior axillary fold, and we just scan, uh, as we saw that we scan the infraspinatus muscle fibers, we just scan uh, on the long axis of the infraspinatus muscle. So the uh, glenohumeral joint. Yeah, this infraspinatus muscle like, uh, joint. So, so this is how the glenohumeral, posterior glenohumeral joint recess looks like. This is the head of the humerus. I just can see the hyperechoic line. And this is uh, the glenoid cavity. 
and this gray uh, little uh, hypoechoic structure is the labrum. So this labrum holds the head of the humerus. Uh, this joint is very important uh, for in the, uh, in the perspective of pain management because uh, treatment of the posterior glenohumeral humeral joint has shown uh, to provide better analgesia in case of adhesive capsulitis. Uh, it's uh, not only static imaging, by dynamic imaging, we can see whether there is even minimal effusion in the posterior glenohumeral joint can be seen by dynamic scanning in which we can just ask our uh, patient to internally or externally rotate their hand in which even this head of the humerus will move and even minimal amount of fluid can be seen at the posterior joint recess. Find the posterior glenohumeral joint. So now we shall try to trace the suprascapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve starts from the brachial plate. Okay. Form which can course medially and then comes to the spinal glenoid notch. Uh, okay, so uh, I think uh, we've covered uh, mostly all of the uh, different aspects of scanning the ultrasound joint. Uh, so now we'll proceed with the presentation. If you have any questions, you can please uh, type your questions in the Q&A session. So after demonstrating the normal uh, ultrasound picture of the shoulder uh, structures, uh, we'd, I'd like to just uh, show how the common shoulder pathologies look like. So here we can see the long head of the biceps tendon uh, in the short axis view. Uh, this is the bicipital groove, this gray echogenic structure, over structure is the long head of the biceps tendon. So I was talking about this echogenic uh, hypoechoic halo. So if this e hypoechoic halo is present around the tendon, then it tells us that there is some collection, some effusion around the tendon uh, in the uh, bicipital tendon sheath. So this is a short axis view and this is a long axis view. In the long axis view, this is where the biceps tendon was supposed to be, but there is completely uh, anechoic and hypoechoic areas, so which tells us that either there is a severe tendinitis of the biceps tendon or there can be a complete rupture of the biceps tendon. So the inflammation, if you put a collar doppler across the uh, short axis, if there is flaring of the uh, color like this, which shows there is marked inflammation around the tendon, so we make a diagnosis of bicipital tendinitis. So another common structure that we identify in ultrasound is uh, retro cuff pathologies. So here we're looking at the supraspinatus in a short axis view where we can see there is a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus muscle. This is another long axis view where we can see partial tear of the supraspinatus muscle. This is the long axis view of the soft scapularis muscle where we can see there's hypoechoic areas inside the uh, muscular fibers, uh, confirming the diagnosis of the soft scapularis tendon there. So this is another image showing uh, the effusion inside the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Remember that we counted the layers from top, skin, succulent tissue, the deltoid muscle, and then the white hyperechoic line now is a two-layered line with a hypoechoic fluid collection inside it. There's also thickening of the synovium. If you can see, it is almost a 0.5 uh, centimeter thick in both the sides, and there is marked effusion inside the bursa, below which is the supraspinatus tendon and the greater tuberosity. This is another picture, again, showing the same pathology, where I just wanted to highlight about the type of fluid that is inside the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Uh, it is thick and it is uh, uh, turbid, and you can see a lot of white uh, structures floating inside the, uh, the effusion, which tells us that it is a bad inflammatory soup. Another picture showing uh, the acromial clavicular joint arthritis. So this is the clavicular end, this is the acromial end. You can see that there's osteophytes and the joint space is reduced uh, and distorted. So confirming the diagnosis of acromial, acromial clavicular joint arthritis. This is a picture showing the posterior glenohumeral joint. This is the humerus, and this is the uh, glenoid cavity. We can see that there's marked reduction in the joint space with irregularity in the uh, bony lining, as well as there is a collection uh, which is uh, uh, inside the capsule, but in the posterior glenohumeral joint. 
So this confirms the diagnosis of the glenohumeral joint arthritis. So, um, so we've looked at the normal uh, sonar anatomy and now we've seen how our pathology of the shoulder joints look in the ultrasound. So now we discuss uh, about the ultrasound guided shoulder interventions. Uh, before talking about uh, shoulder interventions, what I'd like to say is that uh, before doing or before planning any ultrasound scanning or intervention, it's very, very important that we take proper clinical history from our patients and do proper clinical examination. Uh, shoulder joint has a lot of pain generators. So it's not uh, possible to scan all the structures all the time in your busy clinical practice, as well as if you see even anything small pathology, you should not jump into uh, doing shoulder interventions. We determine uh, the diagnosis, pain diagnosis, based on the uh, patient's uh, clinical history and patient's clinical examination. So the clinical examination helps us in a big way to uh, narrow down our differential diagnosis and then plan our intervention accordingly. So if uh, after clinical examination, if you suspect any pathology and if you do your ultrasound scan and if you see some finding and if you're not sure, it's always better to send for some uh, clinical investigation as well as do some imaging study to confirm your diagnosis before planning on your interventions. So now we'll start with the ultrasound guided shoulder interventions. Uh, first, we'll be discussing all these interventions one by one. So starting on discussing the intervention on the long head of biceps tendon. Again, recapitulating the anatomy. Uh, this is the categoric model that's showing the biceps long head tendon. So you see this is a subscapularis muscle on the medial side of the tendon. The subscapularis mus uh, muscle tendon, it merges with the transverse humeral uh, ligament. So Biceps tendon has a very close association with uh, rotator cuff pathology, especially subscapularis muscle. So this is how the anatomical correlation is there. This is another view uh, from medial to lateral view of the uh, long head of biceps tendon. This is the cross section of the long head of biceps tendon at the rotator cuff interval. So this is the subscapularis muscle anteriorly or medially, and this is the supraspinatus muscle. You see there is a, sorry, so you can clearly see that there is a gap here, the triangular gap between the muscles. That is where the rotator cuff interval is. So this biceps tendon uh, forms the biceps pulley in this rotator cuff interval. And you can see that there is this uh, coracohumeral ligament and the superior glenohumeral ligament forming the pulley, okay? So uh, whenever we see biceps tendinitis or we suspect biceps tendinitis in ultrasound scanning, we should be very careful before jumping into that diagnosis and intervening there because primary bicipital tendinitis is very, very rare. In, I think in my practice, I have not seen an isolated biceps tendinitis till date. Uh, but biceps tendon disease can be divided into tendinitis or tenosynovitis, but mostly it is associated with uh, rotator cuff pathology. So you always have to rule out rotator cuff pathology before diagnosis, uh, prime, diagnosis before making a diagnosis of primary bi uh, bicipital tendinitis. So just to highlight the importance uh, of ultrasound uh, guidance in uh, doing the therapeutic injection in biceps tendency, this was a study done by Jonel Pestkevez, just uh, published in 2016. It was one of the first study which compared ultrasound guidance with fluoroscopy guidance for uh, bicep tendency injection. So they found that with ultrasound, the first pass success rate was 90.6% compared to 74% for fluoroscopy. And ultrasound gu guidance had a higher success rate and it also helped uh, visualize the abnormality before injection to make a better diagnosis. But there was no, uh, but both the techn technique had similar pain relief and similar complication rate. Another study uh, published in scientific reports, they associated bicipital peritendinous effusion with subacromial impingement. It was a dynamic ultrasound study where they uh, showed how you can dynamically scan for subacromial impingement. So there is, uh, in this study, they did, uh, took a sample size of 337 shoulders and, and any increase in age, subdeltoid bursitis or thickness of supraspinatus tendon tear and shoulder stiffness was associated with the uh, bicipital peritendinous effusion. So for injection of the biceps tendon, uh, 
many practitioners have different uh, preference. My preference would be a needle of 25 gauge with 1.5 inch needle, a small needle. I injected volume of maybe two to four ml. An approach can be in plane or out of plane both. And my target would be the sinovial seat. A successful injection should reveal the injected surrounding the tendon. And if the tendon swells up, the hypoechoic oval structure swells up during injection, then you should be very careful because you are injecting inside the uh, tendon, not surrounding it. So at the level of the intertubercular groove, this is the biceps tendon. This is the greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity. So this is the lateral part, and this is the medial part. Our needle will come from the lateral side to the medial side. We should always do a collar doppler before uh, putting our needle in to detect the ascending branch of the uh, circumflex humeral artery, anterior circumflex humeral artery, which just lies in the same space. So you, your needle should avoid puncturing through that artery. And then you puncture the tendon sheath and inject around the surrounding the tendon sheath. This is the in-plane approach. You can see in the inset the alignment of the needle and the probe. This is at the level of the intertubercular group and in the uh, ultrasound guided in plane approach, where I target my tendon in the long axis from uh, caudal to cephalic and then inject just below the tendon sheath, not inside the tendon. So you have to be very careful that you're not injecting inside the tendon. So this is injecting the biceps tendon in the rotator cuff interval level. This is the uh, short axis of the biceps tendon. This is the supraspinatus muscles. And uh, we can put in our needle from posterior to anterior, and we can inject the tendon sheath after piercing the sheath. Uh, okay, so now talking about the acromioclavicular joint. It is a synovial joint with its articular surface separated by a wedge-shaped fibrocartilaginous disc, which we saw as a hyperechoic structure in our scan. Uh, this is a coronal cross section of the cadaveric acromioclavicular joint. What I would like you to focus on in these pictures is that the, this is the acromioclavicular joint. If you see carefully, just below the acromioclavicular joint is the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And just below that bursa is your supraspinatus muscle. So if you put your needle in too deep, it's very easily that you can deposit your drug in the bursa or into the supraspinatus muscle. So you have to be careful that you don't uh, introduce your needle too deep. This is one study which uh, supports the accuracy of ultrasound guidance uh, injection of the AC joint compared to the palpation guided uh, landmark technique. So it's a very superficial joint. So many of a clinician, they practice this palpation guided acromioclavicular joint uh, injection. But this study uh, showed that uh, acromioclavicular joint injection uh, only in, on the palpation guided injection, there was only 40% success rate, whereas it, was, it has a very high success rate with the ultrasound. So for injection of the AC joint, uh, mostly I inject AC joint if there is arthritis, if post-traumatic or osteoarthritis of the joint. The needle I use is again a small needle of 25 gauge with 1.5 inch needle. Injected volume would be very less. It's a very small joint. So you should not inject high volume, otherwise you'll rupture the capsule, which will cause even more severe pain to the patient than before. So I inject around one to two ml. My approach can be in plane or out of plane, depending on the patient's anatomy. Sometimes uh, choosing only one way of injecting inside the AC joint can be difficult because of an osteophyte or because of uh, the anatomical uh, problems. And my target would be below the superior acromioclavicular ligament. So this is how we inject. Uh, my needle is coming in from the lateral to medial and I in puncture the uh, superior uh, uh, clavicular acromial ligament and then deposit my drug inside the joint. This is on the in-plane uh, ultrasound guided view, whereas this is a needle you may be, where you can see in an in, uh, ultrasound guided out of plane view inside the joint. Uh, you can also do ultrasound guided in-plane approach on the societal section of the acromioclavicular joint. Sometimes in a very severe arthritic joint, this approach is very helpful. As you can see in the inset, you put your ultrasound probe like this and inject in an in-plane, but in the societal section view. So this is the superior acromioclavicular ligament. You put your needle in like this from anterior to posterior and just inject below the uh, ligament. Now talking about the subacromial and subdeltoid bursa, this is the cadaveric model. Uh, where we can see that it is a potential space. It's a very big space and it covers a lot of area, uh, but if it is normal, then it's completely collapsed. 
So there was one study where they compared ultrasound guided with uh, blind uh, South African and South Delta Versa injection in adults with shoulder pain. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. They found that ultrasound guided corticosteroid injections uh, offer a significant greater clinical improvement over blind uh, injection in the adult with shoulder pain. Uh, so again, for the procedure, I prefer the small needle because it's a very superficial structure, uh, but many of the literature also uh, mention using of a 22 gauge spinal needle, which is of 3.5 inch. The injected volume uh, depends. Um, it, can actually, it can actually be a range from um, uh, four to eight ml. So uh, you have to see uh, how much is the pathology there if you're injecting. And approach in plane, lateral to medial approach. I target the bursa outlined by the periborsal fat. Uh, if you are put your needle tip correctly inside the bursa, even a small volume of 0.5 ml of injected can be seen in your ultrasound screen spreading across the bursal plane. So that's the ultrasound guided in plane approach to the soft deltoid soft acromial bursa coming from lateral to medial side. So this will be, this is the short axis view of the supraspinal tendon. You can also do the injections in the long axis view of the supraspinatus tendon. I prefer this uh, technique because it's more comfortable for the patient as well as for the um, operator. And uh, this is the uh, bursa with thick synovium and we inject inside the uh, bursa. We're talking about glenohumeral joint, uh, the anterior aspect of a cadaver model of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, you can also inject through the anterior approach and this is the posterior uh, aspect of the glenohumeral joint, and which is the most commonly preferred approach to inject inside the glenohumeral joint. Uh, I prefer 22 gauge spinal needle, a 3.5 inch for this procedure. My injected volume would range from um, uh, 8 to 12 ml. An approach would be an in-plane lateral to medial approach. Uh, it, you can also do it in a different approach, but uh, most of the uh, uh, practice nurse have found in-plane to be more easy. And target would be between the free edge of the labrum and the cartilage of the neural head on the uh, capsule. So correct placement of the injected in the posterior approach will result in spread of medication beneath the joint capsule. It should not spread into the intraspinatus muscle or outside the joint. So the indication for injecting in the posterior glenohumeral joint is either for the glenohumeral arthrosis or for the adhesive capsulitis, commonly known as frozen shoulder. There is this paper on scientific reports which talks about effectiveness of glenohumeral joint dilatation for treatment of frozen shoulder. It was a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, uh, they, uh, they analyzed and concluded that distension of the glenohumeral joint provides a long efficacy for, uh, to all the reference treatment, even a single dose of uh, corticosteroid containing regimen uh, if you use it for distension of the glenohumeral joint through the ultrasound guided posterior approach, it is preferable for the management of frozen shoulder and has long term uh, pain relief. Uh, so, now uh, just to show you how we can inject in the anterior glenohumeral joint, uh, we have to ask our patient to externally rotate their arm as much as possible. That's when this maneuver leads to uh, bringing out of the soft scapularis muscle. Uh, from the coracoid complex. So this is where the anterior glenohumeral joint lies. Uh, I prefer injecting uh, in an in-plane technique from lateral to medial. You can also do an out-plane technique uh, and inject into the anterior approach of the glenohumeral joint. So this is a picture showing the ultrasound guided in-plane approach uh, from lateral to medial to the posterior glenohumeral joint. So you can either do it from lateral to medial or also from medial to lateral, depending on the patient's anatomy and your orientation. So, it, so this is the uh, hyaline cartilage uh, covering the uh, head of the humerus. This is the labrum and this is the glenoid cavity. You should inject inside the capsule. So when you inject your drug, the, this capsule will be distended, but there should be no spillage of the drug into the muscle infraspinatus. You can also see the capsule distending over here above the car, uh, hyaline cartilage but it should not come out of the uh, capsule. So now talking about the, about the suprascapular nerve, uh, this is the cadaveric model of the suprascapular nerve. Uh, so it comes out from the superior trunk, upper trunk, and then uh, it travels in the 
suprascapular notch in this solar girdle, and then uh, passes through the spinoglenoid notch. So the indication of suprascapular nerve block can be for pain relief of the adhesive capsulitis of frozen shoulder. There can be, uh, you can uh, treat suprascapular nerve block for uh, suprascapular nerve compression neuropathy or for palliation of acute pain or cancer pain or uh, post-operative pain or for bursitis around the shoulder joint or for adjunct treatment with aggressive physiotherapy also, we can combine it for uh, pain relief. So if we want to inject suprascapular nerve at the brachial plexus level, uh, so this is where we can inject. We can also inject the suprascapular nerve at the um, suprascapular notch, like we've already seen in the video. Uh, to inject this nerve, uh, you can either uh, do an intake technique from a medial to lateral, or you can do an out of plane technique. This is an ultrasound guided in plane approach to, of, to the suprascapular nerve at the infraspinatus fossa, the spinoglenoid notch. Again, we can inject it through the medial to lateral approach. So this is another study where they compare the effectiveness of uh, suprascapular nerve block with physical therapy, placebo, and intra-articular injection in management of chronic shoulder pain. It's a meta-analysis of RCTs, where they've seen that suprascapular nerve block provided better relief after 12, uh, for 12 weeks uh, compared with physical uh, therapy alone or compared with placebo injections. So they demonstrated that uh, ultrasound was the most preference guidance tool to block the suprascapular nerve. And uh, they, uh, however, future studies advise to integrate physical therapy in order to improve the long-term effectiveness of this block. So now uh, we'll be talking about the axillary nerve. This is the cadaveric model where we can see the axillary nerve at the posterior aspect of the shoulder. Uh, if the axillary nerve supplies uh, sensory supply to the uh, inferior and posterior part of the capsule of the glenohumeral joint. So if you want to control the pain in that uh, area, you can do axillary nerve block. Uh, and this is an ultrasound guided in plane opposite the axillary nerve at the quadrilateral space. Uh, this is how we do it. And uh, this is the ultrasound guided in plane opposite of the axillary nerve at the head of the humeral neck level. You identify the uh, lateral uh, humeral circumflex artery the posterior uh, artery, and then you inject uh, around it to inject the axillary nerve block. So another study, they compared the combination of the suprascapular and axillary nerve blocks uh, to interscalene nerve block for analgesia and arthroscopic shoulder surgery. Uh, so th this study uh, showed that combining suprascapular and axillary nerve block uh, provides uh, very good analgesia, which is comparable with the interscalene block after arthroscopic shoulder surgery. So this can be a good information for us to incorporate into our chronic pain practice as well. So that was uh, almost the end of my presentation. Now, uh, uh, I think we can carry on with the case scenario. Um, if there is any question and answer for the live demonstration or for this uh, presentation for the intervention, can we entertain it now? Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Ina. Nina Dini. Uh, till now, I haven't got any question, but like, um, uh, I think um, people are so much interested in the presentation that they are, <laughs> they will be uh, think, typing uh, out the question. I think we can firstly go with the case scenario because okay. normally we just uh, finish all the webinar, then uh, we will raise the uh, questions. The audience will raise the questions. Okay. So yeah. I'll, I'll, proceed, I'll proceed with the case scenario. This is just to give you a perspective because we've been talking, talking, I've been talking, talking a long time and uh, you may have gotten lost in the way. So just to see, uh, have a perspective on how ultrasound can help us with the diagnosis of pain and treatment. So this is just a case. Um, so this case is of a 40 year old diabetic car mechanic who presents to our pain management clinic with complaints of pain over the left shoulder area since past seven months. Firstly, it started with mild pain, who's had some response to pain medicine, but now pain is so severe that he has sleep disturbance with night pain and is not responding to drugs. So there's difficulty and pain is caused by raising even the left arm. There's restricted mobility of the left shoulder and patient is even unable to lie down on the left side. So on clinical examination, we see that the manual muscle testing has grade three. 
There's a painful arm elevation. The near and the Hawkins test is positive and the empty can test is also positive. So uh, just for the audience, any differential diagnosis that comes to your mind, you can type in your uh, answers in the Q&A session. <coughs> Uh, okay, so uh, just to uh, make it, uh, so when, if we are looking at the case scenario, so we also always have to consider for differential diagnosis. We cannot just jump into one conclusion. So uh, we have to rule out uh, trauma, we have to rule out infections and uh, um, we all have to ask a good clinical history uh, related to this patient. This patient is a diabetic and uh, we have to do a good clinical examination as well. So the painful arm elevation is, and uh, the near and the Hawkins test, empty can test being positive, it is indicating that there is a problem with the rotator cuff muscles. Uh, but we also have to see if there is any joint problem, any arthritis problem. So we all have to, we have to consider all the differential diagnoses. And then we have to send the investigation if we are suspecting any pathology, okay? So uh, if needed, if you're thinking of an infection, you have to uh, send the blood investigation, you have to do an imaging study, you can probably do an X-ray on an ultrasound and then make your diagnosis. So X-ray was done in this patient. So you see any finding in the X-ray? The blood investigations came out normal with a slightly raised blood sugar level, but in this x-ray, there was some finding. So I'll just go ahead with the case. In this x-ray, you can see that there is the reduced interval. Okay. So the interval is reduced between the um, head of the humerus and the acromion process. So this tells us that uh, there is some rotator cuff pathology because if, it, if the gap is increased, then we know that the, there is a dislocation of the shoulder joint. And if the gap is decreased, then we know that uh, the, uh, there is a rotator cuff pathology. Then comes to our part for diagnosis, we can always do a musculoskeletal ultrasound finding. So in this patient, what we found was the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, so the slide collection over there. There was a small hypoechoic area in the supraspinatus muscle. The MRI of the shoulder joint also confirmed our ultrasound diagnosis. There was this, uh, in the bursal surface of the supraspinatus, this is the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Along the bursal surface, there was partial tear of the supraspinatus tendon. And even in the insertion area, the articular surface, there was some uh, echogenicity showing that there was inflammation along the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle. So till now, in, is there any question regarding uh, this case scenario? Um, Dr. Sharish, you can check in the Q&A box yeah. and then raise the question to Dr. Nina Dini, then she will answer. Uh, so, uh, till now, regarding this case scenario, there is no question, Nina, so please proceed. Okay, so that was a case of uh, supraspinatus partial tear causing a reactive subacromial subdeltoid bursitis and causing shoulder pain. Okay. So I think I finished my case scenario and now we are in the Q&A session. Um, if okay, any... Nina. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation, both uh, sonar anatomy as well as live, demo, live demonstration. There are a few interesting Hello? questions. Hello. Uh, uh, can my voice be heard? Yes, yes, uh, it can be heard. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Begin. A big, okay, namaste, with Dr. Begin. Namaste. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Ginadini. Mm -hmm. Okay, this type of uh, case scenario is uh, common in our um, pain clinic. Most of the times uh, we get the patients who have been going to the pain physicians and we uh, they come to our pain clinic at the last step with the chronic pain uh, more than six months to maybe one or two years. And on the clinical examination also, 
uh, most of the clinical signs overlap maybe because they have multiple pathologies and when do you, when we perform the ultrasound we see different findings like uh, arthritis of shoulder joints supraspinal uh, bursitis supraspinal supraspinal tear multiple findings are there so can you tell me how we uh, go ahead when we find that in the clinical setting also there is a multiple pathology which is also confirmed in the ultrasound so we uh, will we do multiple intervention at the similar setting or we would like to do one at a time um should i answer that yes. question yes yes yeah. need up please okay thank you uh, dr begin uh, for the uh, question uh, so uh, uh, it's just that muscle uh, partial tears uh, is very common finding in ultrasound scanning. Um, even in an asymptomatic patient, around 60% of the patient may show uh, rotator cuff partial tears. So we don't uh, treat uh, whatever finding we see in ultrasound. It's very important for us to correlate the finding with the clinical history and clinical examination. So if the pain that is causing uh, the, the limitation of the activity or causing the trauma a problem to the patient, is correlating with the ultrasound finding, then only we treat that uh, partial tear. It said it, it, in the medical literature, you can easily see that even for a pe people, for patients with age above 65 years, finding partial tear of rotator cuff muscle is very, very common. So uh, we only treat uh, the uh, partial tears if uh, we confirm the uh, diagnosis that that is the uh, uh, pain generator, which is causing the pain and limiting the joint movement and causing distress to the patient. Uh, and what about the multiple pathologies? Like you have subarachnoidal bursitis on top of that frozen shoulder. Okay. So uh, we should do the multiple pain intervention at a similar setting or would you like to do one setting at a time? Okay, so thank you for that interesting question because it's very important. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, we have to find the pain generator. So we should always think in terms of a pain diagnosis. So what is the primary pathology that has led to uh, for the secondary pathologies? Usually what happens is rotator cuff tears. Uh, uh, firstly, there is partial tear with mild pain and patients ignore that pain with analgesic and the pain subsides. And after years of uh, uh, not getting uh, treated completely, the partial tear itself turns into complete tear or is increased in size. And then uh, along with the tear, uh, they also have a reactive bursitis. They also have acromioclavicular uh, joint uh, arthritis. So the frozen shoulder, the whole, even the glenohumeral joint arthritis develop later on because of the uh, abnormal movement of the shoulder, uh, scapula, uh, the glenohumeral joint. So it's that the pathology develops over years and then when we see the patient at the, let's say at the uh, later years, they have a lot of pathology that we can identify in ultrasound. Now that picture can be a little confusing because you don't know whether you want to inject the bicep tendon first or the bursa first or the glenohumeral joint first. So you have to again, take a detailed clinical history and see, so what is your primary uh, pathology that could have led to the secondary uh, findings. So I usually uh, prefer uh, injecting first, either if I can find the primary pathology, if I can think of a primary pathology, I inject that first. Or if I don't know what the primary pathology is, I treat the condition that is causing the most distress to the patient. So what is causing most distress to the patient, whether it's uh, internal rotation or the external rotation, what is it that causes maximum pain? So I decide on that uh, value, what I inject first. And I don't do usually multiple intervention on the same setting. I counsel my patient and I usually divide the intervention over two weeks each uh, over time and then inject slowly because uh, sometimes injecting into one primary structure can revert the pathology and treat other conditions as well. And you may not uh, need to inject uh, the other structures later on. So I hope I answered your question, Dr. B. Yeah, thank you. Because uh, it is the most uh, confusing part when we get the multiple pathologies. <laughs> Should we treat all the in the one setting or we divide uh, in, into the 
Yes. Um, maybe Dr. Suyish would also add on to his experience on this question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, Vigen, Dr. Vigen, for the wonderful question. Uh, like Nina Dini has uh, rightfully said, uh, we have to first identify the pain generator. And uh, though there can be multiple, uh, multiple pathology in the ultrasound or MRI, which usually pain, usually in pain clinic patient comes with the MRI, uh, with the telling all the, all the uh, conditions that you have mentioned, Dr. Bigan. And uh, in that condition, as my teacher has al always uh, stresses, Dr. Gautam Das, he says that uh, first, uh, don't treat the MRI or, uh, or the UST. Treat, treat the clinical pathology that is bothering the patient the most. And we usually go, uh, my clinical practice, I usually try to uh, decrease the pain in the first setting. Like uh, if, the, if the common cause is pain, uh, I try to elevate, I try to divide the, divide the scenario like Nina Dini into two or three setting and uh, slowly first initially take care of pain by giving uh, either suprascapular block or intra-articular steroid block. And in my clinical practice, I have found the suprascapular nerve block uh, can be an excellent um, minimally invasive um, procedure to uh, relieve pain. And once the pain is relieved, then I uh, observe the patient in two, three weeks, and then uh, again counsel the patient that it is not a one time or one short treatment. And uh, gradually uh, plan the procedure as, uh, as the uh, clinical scenario changes. But like first uh, uh, patient has come to us for decreasing the pain. I try to decrease the pain either with oral medicine or suprascapular nerve block, and then see what are the remaining pathologies gradually then. It seems that the uh, image from Dr. Shrish is not very good. There is some internet problem. I think uh, treating up will increase the uh, pain it's required. Can you see? Uh, am I audible? You, uh, yeah. No, yeah. I think am now it's okay. Okay. So, uh, Doctor, begin like a uh, pain. Uh, it's not a single shot treatment. We gradually along along with the uh, clinical presentation and uh, problem of the patient, uh, we categorize the. Like in triads, <laughs> slowly treat the what is bothering the most, and gradually go back and treat the least bothered uh, part of the patient. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Have I answered you, sir? I yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Because uh, it's the most um, common problem that we uh, face in the pain clinic. And I have another question also. So uh, for the intervention we use, we usually use corticosteroid and plus um, local anesthesia mixer. And nowadays there is a concept of 5% 5, uh, 5 dextrose, 10% dextrose, and even PRP. And that is, is slowly evol ev evolving. So is there any demarcation there? Um, is there any uh, guidelines to suggest uh, whether uh, we should directly go for the 5% dextrose in the first setting, or we should try with the traditional corticosteroid or uh, PRP? Uh, uh, Dr. Nina? Can I take that question? Uh, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you so much for the question, uh, Dr. B. Um, so regenerative medicine or prolotherapy treatments, uh, they're still new. And uh, I don't think there's a very strong papers or evidence or randomized control trials that have formulated into guidelines. But there are a lot of papers coming out uh, about it and there are a lot of uh, uh, level three evidence at least to start uh, using them in our clinical practice. I personally uh, have a very um, uh, good experience with uh, using dextrose prolotherapy as well as PRP. Uh, so it's... <coughs> So it's not what determines which first. Uh, it's basically what is the pathology that you are uh, dealing with. So uh, PRP, uh, platelet-rich plasma, which has a high concentration of platelet and growth factors, uh, it is mostly useful if you inject it inside the joints. Yeah. So I, I would inject it inside the AC joint or glenohumeral joint. Uh, dextrose uh, is a very strong irritant, chemical irritant, but it's very good drug as well as it's very cheap. So talking about 
uh, treating poor patients with this pathology in our setup. So uh, PRP is a little bit expensive because of its processing and its uh, kits. So uh, uh, depending on the pathology, if it is uh, joint uh, degeneration, joint osteoarthritis, I would prefer using PRP. Uh, if it is, uh, if I'm injecting inside the tendons, uh, I would uh, prefer injecting uh, plated pore plasma, PPP, okay. or post injection. Uh, to inject inside uh, muscle tears, partial tears, I would prefer injecting PRP. So it depends on what you are treating first. But using dextrose, if the patient is not affording PRP or PPPs or bone marrow concentrates, is a great uh, idea uh, for a country like ours where lots of poor patients don't have access to high uh, medical care. So dextrose prolotherapy, if used judiciously, can give you a, a result which is as good as PRP. It's just that you might have to repeat the injections sometimes. But so we can, uh, we can uh, inject the dextrose into the <coughs> joint if we suspect of some frozen disorder. Yes, of course. Yeah. So uh, one uh, question may be arise that like if we using the dextrose, our yeah. traditional teaching is that dextrose is a um, good medium for the bacterial growth. So if we are directly injecting the dextrose, should we take extra precaution or some antibiotic prophylaxis? Uh, okay, I'll answer uh, that. <laughs> okay, Nina. Okay. Okay. We both will answer that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the dextrose that we use is a, a medical uh, pharmaceutical dextrose. So it is already sterile. Uh, we always use our uh, sterile precaution in all our procedures. Especially if you are injecting inside the joint, you have to take special precautions because we do not want to infect our joints. Having said that, uh, dextrose uh, is also a very good chemical in the sense that it is uh, inside... It is just dextrose, it is glucose basically, which is also there inside our body. And it is water soluble. The most important thing about injecting dextrose is it's water soluble. So as soon as we inject dextrose, it doesn't stay inside a cavity and stay there for a long time. It is water soluble, it gets disseminated and it, it, it spreads very easily to the tissues. So I don't think uh, if we take sterile uh, precaution for our interventions, uh, injecting dextrose would uh, uh, have any uh, risk of uh, causing infections. So, uh, yeah, so we don't have to use the antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, no, I don't think no. so. I don't yes. uh, Dr. Began, I usually, in my clinical practice, uh, like as we are injecting in joint, as Nina Dini say, has uh, said, a special, all aseptic precaution has to be taken, whether we are injecting anything, PRP, steroid, or dextrose. And it is just a myth that dextrose prolotherapy or anything with dextrose will uh, will will cause more infection in patient and we are more worried about the infection. But in my clinical practice, what I usually do is to, if the patient is diabetic and if the diabetes is in a slightly in a higher side, uh, I usually go for a, a single set uh, uh, second generation cephalo, uh, antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. But normally, if the blood sugar is not is normal or the, if the patient is not diabetic, uh, we usually don't go for the uh, antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. Also, yeah, okay. uh, okay, the one more thing to add on that is it, it's what we are trying to do with the prolotherapy is the injecting irritant inside the disease tissue to cause local inflammation with the hope that the body will now heal the tissue with a good uh, immune response. So uh, uh, giving antibiotics can also alter that response. So using antibiotic uh, blindly in a blanket manner is not recommended. Uh, like Dr. Siri said, if you, there is a risk of infection with a diabetic patient with high blood sugar, you can choose to uh, uh, cover your, your procedure with an antibiotic, but routine use of antibiotic for any prolotherapy, even PRP or dextrose is not recommended. Okay. Uh, there is one very good question from our new member in pain society, uh, Dr. Jay Prakash. He has said that what is the concentration of dextrose that we usually use for the procedure of prolotherapy? Okay, Nina. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Jay Prakash. And <laughs> Nice to hear from you, actually. Uh, uh, so I would like to answer that question. I use dextrose rampantly in my practice. So there's a different concentration of dextrose I use for different pathological conditions. So let's say if I'm doing a nerve hydrodissection for 
peripheral nerve entrapment like a carpal tunnel syndrome, I would use 5% uh, dextrose only. Whereas if I'm injecting dextrose inside the tendons like a bicep tendinitis, I'd go for a slightly higher yes, concentration, yes. Uh, yeah, 10 yes, to 12%. Yes. Uh, but no, if I have to inject it inside uh, articular space, uh, provided I have no other options, then uh, I prefer a higher concentration than that. I'd probably even go to 25% depending on the patient's condition because uh, some patients who have very refractory pain to uh, uh, other treatments, uh, I prefer using high concentration of dextrose in those patients. So I hope I have answered Dr. Jayaprakash's question. Dr. Jayaprakash, if you are here, you can uh, join. Uh, can I go to other questions? Uh, one person has said that, uh, can we inject steroid in the muscle? Oh. Uh, Nina, can we inject steroid in the muscle? Well, I think uh, some people <laughs> inject steroid in the muscles if they are planning on building up the muscles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but not for the treatment of pain. Huh? But not for the treatment of pain. So okay. they inject anabolic steroids for, you know, uh, making bulky muscles of going for Mr. Handsome competition, I guess. <laughs> but uh, generally, as medical treatment uh, for chronic pain conditions, uh, steroid is not recommended anymore to be injected inside the muscles. It can be injected inside the joints. Uh, the arthritic, the uh, inflamed joints, or inside the inflamed bursa. If there is huge effusion with bursitis, uh, I would prefer injecting steroids first inside the uh, bursitis to decrease the inflammation. And in the second stage, after probably three to four weeks of injecting steroids, I can plan for other treatment therapy like prolotherapy or other stuff. So no, my answer is you cannot inject steroids inside the muscles. What do you okay. think? Okay. No, no, it is absolute. It's a red, uh, red zone area. We we are not uh, supposed to inject steroid in the muscle, uh, at least for a pain management uh, perspective. And another question is uh, right, uh, for the adhesive capsulitis, as it is most common clinical condition that we visit in that the, for the patient visit in the pain clinic. One uh, person has asked uh, uh, whether the anterior or posterior glenohumeral joint injection is more useful. And uh, is hydrodilatation useful in ad adhesive capsulitis? Uh, and another, I would like to add on another question. Our Jay Prakash has also asked about um, explanation of the capsular hydro hydrodilation for the adhesive capsulitis. Okay, Nina, pass on okay. to you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, adhesive capsulitis. Uh, when I see a patient with adhesive capsulitis, um, if the it depends on the, it's, it's a big spectrum actually. Adhesive capsulitis is a big spectrum. So if a patient comes to you in an initial condition, we treat it conservatively like any other uh, physician with uh, NSAID and uh, physical therapy. But no, if the patient has come to in a later stage where there is marked uh, adhesion, very limited movement of the uh, uh, so glenohumeral joint with severe pain, then uh, my preference of choice would be hydrodilatation. So there's two things actually. There's two different techniques. Hydrodilatation is a little different than uh, hydrodistension of the capsule. So hydrodilatation, what we do is we inject two needles inside the joint. From one side, we inject uh, whatever fluid you're injecting, a combination of local anesthetic steroid and hyaluronic acid from one end, and we close both the needles and create a pressure which uh, um, causes the dilatation and then release the pressure from the outer needle. That's hydrodilatation as described in the textbooks or in the uh, medical literature. There's another thing, hydrodistension, in which we can inject a little high volume inside the capsule of the posterior glenohumeral joint, which distends the capsule, as you can see visibly in the ultrasound. The capsule is quite distended, but we don't inject it in a single row. The most important clue in uh, doing both hydro distension or hydrodilatation is that we don't forcibly inject high volume in a single instance. What we have to do is we inject small aliquots and wait. Let that volume settle in and let it distend the capsule. Then we inject some more volume and let it sit for a while and distend more capsule. So we do it very slowly, 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 and we increase our volume till we get a good distension of the capsule. So hydrodistension you can do in a single setting 
and it has a very good result with adhesive capsulitis. Hydrodilatation also you can uh, do in a single setting, but you have to do, uh, it, it takes a lot of time. So my uh, request or my uh, experience uh, to young paint physicians is that if you are planning on doing a hydrodistension or a hydrodilatation to the adhesive capsulitis of the posterior glenoid angle joint, please do not inject all the volume at once because while if you do that, number one, you're, you will not be able to achieve uh, good hydrodissection. Number two, you can rupture the capsule if you're injecting high volume in a single go, which can cause even more pain than before. So um, I totally love doing hydrodistension. I mostly do hydrodistension on my patient with adhesive capsulitis. So I hope I've answered uh, this question. Can I add something in this answer? So um, hydro, hydro distension is a very uh, useful tool, uh, especially uh, in uh, adhesive capsulitis. But um, I think uh, it would be better for a young pain physician to go for a suprascapular nerve block before hydrodilatation or distension because it, uh, it uh, can produce lots of pain. So what I usually do, uh, usually do is uh, combine suprascapular nerve block uh, and followed by hydro, uh, hydro distension and all precautions taken like with a small allocates of drug given because a uh, patient coming to the pain clinic are usually uh, uh, people with the middle class and upper middle class people with uh, the, and which are they which they cannot <laughs> bear any pain so uh, as a precautionary method i usually initially go for suprascapular uh, not block uh, with either with or without steroid and then proceed with hydrodilatation and hydro uh, It will give you a, uh, a calm and quiet patient in front of you. Otherwise, if you just go for hydrodilatation or distension, patient can be a bit annoying and uh, the procedure can fail also. Thank you. Uh, what is your opinion, Nina, about... I really agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> block followed by... The, uh, yes, you, you always have to do block or do some sedation before doing that. So it's a very painful procedure. So, Dr. Shrish, uh, can you also check in the Q&A box because there are also other questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one person, Muslik, has uh, asked, uh, how is suprascapular nerve block going to help for long-term pain management and relief? Isn't it a motor nerve, uh, which is a very good question. Uh, Nina? I think so, I, I, uh, I would request Dr. Smith to answer this question. <laughs> okay. Uh, suprascapular nerve is a mixed nerve. Uh, you are rightfully uh, right. But it depends upon, uh, like we are not, it depends upon what uh, thing you have, want to achieve with suprascapular nerve block. If it's just an uh, entrapment of suprascapular nerve, we can give, uh, we can just release the entrapment with hydrodissection under ultrasound with just 5% dead stores and a little bit of lignocaine. And uh, regarding the pain relief uh, with a suprascapular nerve block, it depends upon what procedure you are doing. Like if you are giving for a, just lignocaine for a diagnostic block, it will relieve pain for two, three hours and pain will come back again. If you add a bit of a steroid, uh, the uh, duration of pain relief will be a bit more, more like three to four months. And if you are going for radiofrequency ablation, yes, it is a motor nerve. You have to be careful. We cannot go for a, full-blown uh, conventional. Well, it seems that the internet from the Dr. Shrish is not good now. The image is frozen again. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue with the discussion. So what Dr. Shrish was saying was... Um, radio frequency. We can give uh, a low temperature uh, modified RFA is even much better. So, uh, motor Yeah, Dr. Nina Dini, can you take up with the uh, discussion? So also, uh, while doing the suprascapular nerve block, uh, if you are sending the patient to physiotherapy, so I mostly do suprascapular nerve block if I want to uh, push the patients to physiotherapy. So I do the nerve block, I communicate with my physiotherapist and send the patient to physiotherapy for uh, uh, movement. Uh, then I would, uh, obviously it's, I don't, so we can always do the local anesthetic concentration. So depending on the local anesthetic concentration, we can do a sensory block, not a motor block. So I use very low concentration local anesthetic, which will only do the pain relief and not cause significant uh, motor paralysis, and then send the patient for physiotherapy. So that way also, 
uh, you can use suprascapular nerve block for your uh, uh, pain management. So, okay. Uh, so I think I'll move on to another question. Yes. Uh, there is a question to... from Eileen Chong. Uh, please ask me a question, Mandy. I'll just uh, answer. Yeah. Uh, she okay. says that, uh, thank you, Dr. Nina Dini, for a very informative presentation and demo. And may I know which injected do you use, injectate do you use, the concentration, and do you mix with LA? And if yes, which type? Uh, okay. So uh, <laughs> that's a broad question, actually. If she had asked me about any parts that I could have answered. Uh, clearly, but uh, if I'm injecting uh, inside a bursitis or a effusion, then I usually prefer local anesthetic, a bupivacaine with a concentration of 0.25% with uh, steroids. Uh, my choice of steroid would be uh, uh, triamcinolone or methylprednisolone. If I'm injecting uh, in, into the muscle partial tears, I usually prefer injecting uh, dextrose. Uh, or PRP. Uh, I don't like mixing uh, those prolotherapy treatments with local anesthetics, but I inject local anesthetic for uh, the needling uh, and for a numbing of the patient. Uh, so, it, uh, so that's the concentration I use. If I'm doing a suprascapular nerve block and sending the patient to physiotherapy, I use less than 0.1 concentration of bupivacaine, and I can add steroid to prolong the effect. So it depends basically on what you are trying to achieve. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, hope this answer is satisfied to Ellen. And there's another question. How to treat pain due to partial tear of rotator cuff muscle? Okay, so if the patient presents to you with an acute tear uh, and the pain is mild to moderate, patient is okay, then you can always opt for conservative treatment where you can prescribe the patient with a course of anti-inflammatory medicines and rest and uh, that will usually take care of the partial tear. But if the patient has already uh, gone into a chronic condition uh, with the partial tear and with the partial tear has developed secondary other pathologies like maybe an arthritis, uh, posterior plane femoral joint arthritis or a very sensitive pain, severe pain, neuropathic pain, then uh, again, you need to uh, treat uh, uh, the pain first. You need, need to decrease the severity of the pain. So if needed, you can do an intervention in combination with prescribing oral medications. Um, so that's how you can uh, treat it actually. So partial tears, if it's very small and if it's not ca causing much pain, uh, in my practice, I treat it conservatively. If it is severe enough to impair daily activities, impair sleep, and impair uh, food habits, then I intervene uh, partial tears with uh, prolotherapy, probably uh, high concentration dextrose or PRP. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, there is another question is, cannot we inject drugs into AC joint only with palpation? It's so superficial. Uh, okay, thank you for that question. I talk, talked about it in my presentation, actually. Uh, I know it, everybody tends to, you know, just palpate. It's a very superficial joint, so you tend to inject it. It's just below the skin, okay? But there's actually studies being done which have shown that when you inject by palpation method, as I've shown in my picture, if you remember, just below the joint is a subacromial subdeltoid bursa or in the supraspinatus muscle. So the depth of injection is actually difficult to do if you're doing the palpation method. If you inject too deep, you may actually not be injecting inside the AC joint. And also by study, they've seen that in, let's say for 10 patients, you injected by palpation method, only four landed up inside the AC joint. All the rest were outside the AC joint, probably too deep inside. So it all depends on your practice. So those are the reasons why uh, ultrasound guidance has taken over. Uh, for injection inside the AC joint. Okay, thank you for your great thank answer, you. Dr. Nina Dini. Another question is which injection has better control of shoulder pain in case of adhesive uh, capsulitis? Uh, and the question is which injection has better control of shoulder pain in case of adhesive capsulitis, anterior or posterior glenohumeral joint injection. 
Okay, so I'd included this part also in my study. There was a paper that I discussed where they'd compared uh, in, uh, injecting into the anterior and posterior glenohumeral joint, and they'd follow up the pain outcomes, long-term outcomes in pain, uh, reduction of pain scores. So they found that uh, injecting in the posterior glenohumeral joint had longer period of pain relief and more pain relief compared to injecting into the anterior glenohumeral joint. So uh, I, I also prefer doing it you know, from the posterior glenohumeral joint, but sometimes uh, knowing about uh, approaching the anterior glenohumeral joint can be very important, especially if the posterior glenohumeral joint is very arthritic and the capsule is uh, not outlined carefully and you can't inject inside it, that approach uh, rescues you and you can easily inject inside the joint. Okay, and there's another new question from the chat box from uh, Dr. J. Can we mix a steroid with dextrose? Okay, uh, thank you, Jay, for the question. Uh, <laughs> okay, so injecting dextrose with a steroid is uh, very controversial. The reason being, uh, dextrose is an irritant. My, when I inject dextrose, I plan to cause a local irritation. Steroid whereas is an anti very strong anti-inflammatory drug. So uh, what it does is it subsides inflammation. It decreases irritation. So I don't see any logic of combining dextrose with steroid. And I don't uh, do it in my practice. Okay. Um, um, then um, Dr. Shreesh, you're yeah. back finally. Yes, yes. <laughs> internet connection so was lost. Yeah, can you go, go to the uh, Q&A box because there is another question. Uh, he questioned, what was the treat, uh, treatment given? So I don't quite understand this question. Can you uh, take up the Q&A session for oh, this okay. question? Uh, uh, I think that the, the, the uh, attendee is asking about that case scenario. Ah, that okay. I wanted to know what is the treatment given to that patient. So for that patient, uh, uh, we injected uh, dextrose uh, inside the uh, partial tear and uh, with some oral uh, analgesics, uh, non-inflammatory ones. Uh, we didn't uh, advise any anti-inflammatory drugs. And uh, after a few weeks, two to three weeks time, uh, the patient was sent for uh, physical therapy. So I hope I have answered that question. Any more okay. questions? Okay, there is no... Dr. Shreesh, uh, you can yeah. check. Yeah, in the yes, but, box. Uh, there are no uh, no new question in the comment box right now. Actually, it is I I cannot see any question right now because I was locked. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. He was locked out, right? right, right. Okay. Oh, so oh, one I question see. is there. Yeah. One question is there. Okay, Nina. Uh -huh. So do you think five percent or triumphs alone would be more effective for carpal tunnel syndrome? Lee Chong <laughs> has asked whether five percent dextrose or steroid triamcilone tri will be more effective for carpal tunnel syndrome. Nina? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much sure. for that question, actually. <laughs> okay, I'll try to answer that as much as possible. Uh, in my initial days of practice, uh, I used to do hydrodissection of the uh, median nerve with uh, local anesthetic and steroid combination. But at that time, uh, the use of 5% dextrose was not so prevalent and there were not a not lot of papers that had come in. Uh, I think after 2014, there was a paper uh, which described 5% dextrose prolotherapy for carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, after reading that paper, uh, when I initially tried it in my clinical practice, uh, I had a little hesitation. But after 2016, I have been practicing uh, injecting only 5% dextrose into the carpal tunnel uh, syndrome for hydrodissection of the median nerve. And I find uh, that it has great results. It's just that the procedure may be painful for so many of the patients who have very severe pain, neuropathic features. So uh, you can um, inject local to numb the skin area very carefully on the ultrasound to make sure that it does not uh, trackle inside the uh, and very near to the uh, median nerve. So uh, I've been injecting 5% dextrose for carpal tunnel syndrome and it has great results. Uh, I think the duration of pain relief which is, is, is what that matters. With steroid, it has immediate pain relief in two to three days, but the duration is very short. But with 5% dextrose, it takes a little bit more time to attain good pain relief, probably a week or two. But after that, you have a, a very good pain relief for a very long time. 
So I hope I, I hope I've answered that question, Mr. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, very nicely. Uh, but uh, I have very uh, less uh, clinical practice of using uh, prolog uh, five percent dextrose in median nerve. I usually use go for uh, methylprednisolone instead of triamcinolone, and uh, it has also given other of uh, not all, but like there are a few. A uh, small group of people who is required uh, injection in every six months, but vast majority of patients uh, has been improved with single sort of methylprednisolone. So, like, uh, but I am a bit new in care in pain practice, so I have yet to see all the effects. But like, both are equally good. <laughs> you can do. No, actually, both. <laughs> I'm, uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually waiting for a good uh, trial study which compares both uh, studies. Then only we can come to a conclusion. Actually. <laughs> so there are uh, now no more new question till questions now in my box. Okay. Yes. So. Um, Mandy, do you have any question in QA box? Or no, questions? now there is no new one coming. So, okay. yeah, thank you again, Dr. Ninadini, for answering those questions and also the great presentation. And so I think. Uh, yeah, that's all for today's presentation and Q&A session. So thank you everyone for your time to uh, attend this meeting and make this event successful. If you have any I'll, queries- I'll continue for- uh, He's back, oh, she's back, she's back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, Matt, something, your uh, video was frozen over here, we couldn't hear you. But what about now? Yeah, now we can yes, hear you. Sir, yeah. Ah, okay, so thank you for everyone uh, for making the time to be here and attend this meeting and make this event so successful. You see there, there's uh, lots of interactions in the Q&A session. So, um, so uh, I need to say, so this uh, we have to conclude this meeting. If you have any queries or comments about today's topic or any uh, comments on the technology, please feel free. Uh, to contact us or reach out to our channel partner or the academic partner, uh, NASP. So uh, that's all for today's uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, to Dr. Nina Dini and Dr. Shrish. Uh, so can I, do we have one or two minutes? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. Um, uh, regarding uh, the use of ultrasound in pain practice is a uh, very uh, uh, growing, uh, there are lots of people with growing interest and I think uh, being a pain physician, you have to have uh, a good uh, knowledge of uh, anatomy first, followed by sono anatomy. And mm -hmm. then if you can, if you can combine this anatomy with sono anatomy with good, uh, good US emission like uh, uh, Ysonic, then the results will be excellent. Uh, and um, with the development of science and technology, our medical science is also developing a lot. And for clinical uh, clinic, for a pain physician, I think it's a mandatory to have a ultrasound in the all the in the pain clinic. And uh, with the ultrasound, it's not that the clinical diagnosis will be uh, hundred percent right, but you'll be uh, you'll be at, at least uh, you'll be more confident in diagnosing or. or or the patient will be more confident in, in your diagnosis as he or she will be uh, examined or uh, examining the ultrasound along with you. And if uh, they find the pathology, uh, pathology right on time, then it will be patient satisfaction will also be nice. And regarding cost also, if you use ultrasound, if you have ultrasound knowledge and, uh, and if you are using ultrasound in a clinical practice, then uh, the treatment of pain procedure will be also less uh, less uh, expensive as well as l less time consuming. So I'd, I advise all my colleagues, uh, junior colleagues or senior colleagues to use integrate ultrasound as, as early as possible because it is the future in pain management uh, also as well as in regenerative medicine. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shrish, for your great sharing on the uh, ultrasound used in pain, uh, pain management. And also thanks again for Dr. Nina Dini for the uh, great presentation. So also thank you for every audience, no matter in China or, or, or other the world. Uh, thank you for attending. We hope you have learned and also enjoyed this presentation. So 
I think we are looking forward to the next webinar. Uh, next yes. webinar, uh, both Nina Dini and uh, I am very much eagerly awaiting because this is, was the first our first uh, date. Uh, I think if there is any problem, uh, we'll make it better next time. Surely <laughs> we'll make it better. And we are planning to go to uh, do these uh, webinar of other joints, so we are MSK, uh, which is useful for payment. Thank you. Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank That's you. all for today's webinar. Thank you. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.